Hello, wonderful Perez. Um, thank you for joining me on this recorded Zoom meeting. I'm sorry we couldn't meet in a live meeting, but schedules get crazy in the springtime, as you all know. Uh, so today we're going to talk about student engagement in the springtime. And this topic came to us from your suggestions. So thank you for each of you who reach out and say, hey, um, I think we need some help or some ideas on this certain topic. Um, we really take those to heart and try to get you information that you need. Um, I'm Steph Lundgren from ESU8 in Neely. I'm going to move this bar to show you. And um, we also have the link to our Perez website. So it's bit.ly slash Paris of ESU8. There you will find um, this recording, which you've probably already found it then. Um, you will also find resources from our previous meetings and our summer day long meetings. So um, that's just kind of your go to place as a para to find um, more information about topics you need. And so the first thing I want you to think about is some springtime celebrations that you might have. What's gone great in your school year this year? What have kids achieved or you as educators achieved? Um, what is just making your school year um, go well? Uh, so if you are watching this with a group, go ahead and pause the recording now and you can each share out a celebration. If you're watching this alone, just kind of think through something that's going really well. Um, I think we all um, we need to pause in the springtime um, and really all throughout the year and think about those wonderful things and the, um, the successes of our students. Maybe um, you've worked really hard on fluency with some kids and their Acadian scores are fa uh, fantastic this spring, um, or uh, maybe some behaviors have really gotten better throughout the year. Uh, maybe your um, team of educators are just working so well together. Um, all of those things we need to take the time out and recognize and honor uh, and really celebrate all of those good things happening in your schools. I know that there are so many things. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about student engagement first. Just what is student engagement? Um, one source, I'm going to move my bar here so we can actually see that definition. One source says in education, student engagement refers to the degree of attention, curiosity, interest, optimism, and passion that students show when they are learning or being taught, which extends to the level of motivation they have to learn and progress in their education. So it's, it's more than just um, good behavior as they <clears throat> sit through class, but really how are they um, emotionally tying all that, you know, their attention, that curiosity, that interest, um, and really getting involved in their, their learning. So how do you know when students are engaged and is it, is uh, compliant behavior alone a sign of engagement? Um, I'm not so sure. So um, again, if you're with a group, pause this recording and talk about how you know that students are engaged uh, in their learning. Um, and then, you know, I think sometimes we confuse that, you know, that good behavior, that quiet behavior uh, for engagement. So a kid can be looking at a book and it seems as though they're reading, but they're really not engaged much in it. Um, you know, so we have to look for those signs. Um, do students know what's going on in class? Are they able to complete tasks when asked? Um, is their mind really focused on the task at hand? So let's talk about um, some different examples as we go on here. There are different um, levels of engagement that we might have, and that's how we can kind of start to see um, when students are engaged. So um, if we start at the top there, that's um, that true engagement. Moving my bars all over. Thanks for bearing with me there. Um, so that's persistence, that sustained inquiry. They're constantly trying to figure things out and trying to understand better. 
that self-direction that they're going to keep learning without having the teacher on top of them telling them each step to do and kind of a playfulness with the content. They might take it to a different level. They might make some great connections and things like that. Um, and it's just unprompted. So they're gonna say, that reminds me of this time when I did this, or, hey, I learned this skill in science class. I'm gonna apply it in social studies class because it seems to fit here. And really transfer that understanding between subject areas just on their own. And then we have some strategic compliance. So there's some clear effort there and some creativity and focus on directions and task completion in order to meet those extrinsic standards for motivation. So that kid really isn't intrinsically motivated. They don't find their motivation within themselves. It's more like I'll be motivated to earn a prize or to get a grade or to please my parents or my teachers, but it's not really within them to like be really engaged in learning. And then we have ritual compliance too. Um, you know, uh, this is the kid who, yeah, we're compliant because we're going to get decent grades to um, go out for a sport maybe, um, avoid those consequences, those um, you know, punishment that might be um, involved. So they say here, no creativity, genius, curiosity transfer. They're going to do what they need to do and get on with it. And then we have retreatism. So not much effort um, or productivity or progress, um, no inquiry. They're just not connecting with what they're doing. And then we get to rebellion where it's almost a disruptive behavior. So we're gonna go on here and we actually have a video to watch that's gonna to talk to you more about those levels of engagement. Select these levels of engagement in less than five minutes, I promise. If you watch this scene from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you'll notice that even in the midst of a boring lesson, none of the students are actually misbehaving. They're quiet. Nobody's tossing spitballs or playing those paper football games or checking their cell phones because, well, the cell phones back then were the size of a brick. Remember the Zach Morris phone. But most of the students are essentially following the rules. They aren't engaged, but what are they? Well, some seem to be retreating. A few seem to be playing the game of school, but nobody is actually committed to the learning. Well, here's where Schlechti's levels of engagement becomes helpful. It provides a useful framework for thinking about what it means for students to be genuinely engaged in their learning. Schlechti defines it this way. Engagement is active. It requires the students to be attentive as well as in attendance. It requires students to be committed to the task and find some inherent value in what he or she is being asked to do. The engaged student not only does the task assigned, but also does the task with enthusiasm and diligence. In 2002, Philip Schlechte developed a framework for thinking about student engagement based on two core ideas of attention and commitment. At the bottom you have rebellion, which involves diverted attention and no commitment to the task. This is the student who seems to be acting out and causing disruptions, and as a result, they fail to learn from the task. Next, you have retreatism with no attention and no commitment. Unlike the rebellion, this student in retreat is not actively disrupting the learning, but instead seems to be kind of checked out. This student is often distracted and emotionally withdrawn from the task, and as a result, this student learns little or nothing from the task. At the next level, you have ritual compliance. This involves both low attention and low commitment. Unlike retreatism, a ritually compliant student doesn't completely check out, but instead is doing the bare minimum to avoid confrontation. This student will learn at a low level, and the task will not be retained over time. Next is strategic compliance. Often this looks like engagement because the student might be performing at a high level, but it's not. Here the student has high attention on the task, but low commitment to what he or she is doing. 
This is the student who is playing the game of school, focused on things like grades, parental approval, rewards, and class rank. But the learning isn't intrinsically rewarding, and as a result, this student will often learn at a high level, but fails to retain the learning over time or transfer it to a new context. And then finally, you have engagement. This requires both high attention and high commitment. Here, a student completely buys in out of a strong sense of intrinsic motivation, and this includes meaning and choice and challenge. This student will continue focusing even when the task gets more complex and challenging, and often they're going to choose to learn even when it is ungraded. This student will learn at a deep level and the transfer will continue to new contexts. And this is why it's important that we as teachers focus on how to make the subject intrinsically engaging. And this happens when we tap into student curiosity and creativity and purpose. And when this happens, students are more likely to grow into passionate, lifelong learners. So isn't that what we want to cultivate, right? Those, those lifelong learners who um, just want to stay in the learning and um, get so much out of it, so much personal fulfillment and fulfillment for their life, um, maybe career choices and things like that. So select these. There we go. So we want to sustain that engagement that we might build during the school year, even in the springtime. So um, like we say, there are lots of learning until that last day. So we're going to continue learning through our whole school year. And um, just like you all asked for ideas on this topic, it's a challenge in the springtime. So when does that engagement start to fade for them? For me in the classroom, I always felt like it was when the time changed. <laughs> and uh, uh, in recent years, we've started changing our time in March instead of April. When it was April and it was warm out, the little kids that I taught were out playing more. Um, they uh, wanted to be up later at night. They were a little tired um, when they came to school for the day. They just wanted to be out playing during the day and it was hard to keep their focus. Um, and older kids, I think, fall into the same boat and maybe even just, you know, get a little tired of our um, routines and things like that in the classroom. So we have to find ways that we're going to um, engage them even when it gets tough. So one author suggests that we think about engagement um, like a DJ at a techno club. <laughs> All right, um, and think about the way that they engage the crowd as they're playing their music for them. So um, think of us educators as kind of DJs here as we talk about these next few ideas. And we can use an acronym here. So engagement is epic. So focus on experiences, right? Participation and connect, connect, connect. So that can be like epic. All right, so some of the experiences that we can focus on with the kids um, are things like design learning with the kids in mind and see lessons through the student size, right? We might include some team building exercises and activities on a regular basis um, things like playing music for the class, um, changing up the furniture and decorations can um, engage them because it's a little bit of a switch or it's a little bit something new. So, um, you know, when we're seeing the lessons through their eyes, we're just trying to make them a little bit more fun, a little bit more exciting. Um, I know I played a lot of music in the classroom and you don't want it to be that distracting level. Um, and you have to kind of know your crowd, you know, like if kids can handle a more lively kind of music, then you can play that. But maybe it's just a song as they walk in the door to just really get them hooked. Um, and I, I think that, you know, changing up the furniture or the decorations or maybe just on certain days when you really need their focus or their attention or you really want to just draw, you know, some unique novel situation to their attention. Um, just do something a little bit fun and out of the ordinary. 
um, in the same way as changing up their environment inside, on nice days, I would take my class outside every now and then. Um, my kids had clipboards that they could put their math worksheets on, and sometimes we'd go outside to do those. Um, but um, again, I taught younger students, we'd go outside for read aloud. Um, you know, it was just um, certain things. And I'd tell my kids, hey, if you can't handle it, we'll go back in. But I'm trying to make this a little bit fun, a little bit different. So let's try to um, maintain our same rules and procedures as we go outside and just switch it up a little bit for them. Um, also make learning hands-on um, and minds-on, right? This is different, hands-on and minds-on. Think about that. Okay, so they're going to do something with their hands. They're going to have maybe an investigation in science or um, they're going to build a model of something, um, but also that engages their mind. So it's difficult enough that it's going to keep them thinking about things. Maybe it's a um, problem to solve, um, a community type problem, a real world type problem that they can work as a team on. Um, and they say not just ears and eyes on. So ears on and eyes on can sometimes be deceiving. It can kind of be that playing school that the um, video talked about where I'm looking at you and I'm kind of listening. Well, we can't really tell if kids are listening all the time, right? Um, so we really wanna engage them and make them think about things, not just sit and look and listen. Um, we can use play-based learning. Uh, maybe they're gonna role play some things out for us. Uh, I know in high school, one of the things we loved in one of our American government classes were having debates about different um, laws and rights that we had as citizens of the United States. So when we could do something like that, um, it was very engaging and we really were applying what we were learning about our government um, into these debates. Also those student investigations, like we talked about in science and in social studies, you might do some of these really inquiry-based instruction um, and maybe even research projects. So you're coming to the end of the year where you've gained a lot of knowledge throughout the year, apply that knowledge into that investigation or that research project um, to really apply those skills and um, use those skills and pull them all together for the year. And also service learning. So is there a service project you can do with your students for your community? Um, maybe the elderly in your community. Uh, I used to lead um, a community cleanup at our park uh, where our kids, all, all of our elementary kids would go down and serve our park. Um, but there's a lot of learning to go along with that too on how, to, how the city works and how the public works takes care of the park and things like that. So think about some kind of service learning you could do based on some of your content. Um, maybe it's just doing a random act of kindness around your building for another group, uh, another classroom, uh, maybe their teacher or maybe several teachers. Um, Think about just something that you can do that's nice. Uh, my teammate and I once just made bookmarks for her brother's uh, class. The, they were first graders, I think, at the time. Um, uh, just think of something nice that you can do um, and you're really um, having kids think about others. And then uh, also cultivate classroom tra traditions and celebrate milestones. So we can engage kids by having those traditions and maybe it's on a birthday, um, somebody's birthday that that's their tradition of we're gonna do a certain thing. Um, maybe it's celebrating milestones like you're working with an intervention group and after every so many lessons of mastery or something like that, um, you have a small celebration and that celebration can still be like a little game played that's still learning based. So you're still, involved in that subject, but you're taking time out to recognize them for, um, for all the learning that's occurred um, during that year or during that milestone period. Um, I think everybody loves to celebrate. Most kids just love that time of something special in the classroom. So um, I think also when we have those traditions, um, it connects the kids in the room um, and that's so important. In fact, that's one of our letters that's gonna come up here. 
And we have a couple different kinds of participation. So first, um, that kind of involvement in your classroom. So when we can involve kids, um, it increases their engagement. So we might even give them clearly defined roles in our room. Now, I said I was an elementary teacher, so we all know we have a helper chart, right? And kids get to help around the classroom and do different jobs during the week. And I always found that my little kids just love these jobs. Um, they love to be part of the room. They love to be um, uh, an integral part of, of making our, our room run correctly. Um, of course, there were certain jobs that were their very favorites. Uh, and I think it just gave them ownership in our room. And then they even took care of our room better. Um, they, they didn't call it just my room, but it was our room. And even I would have kids come back. I miss this, you know, I think because they just felt so connected. Um, but I think older kids can do this too. So think about some roles like the greeter at the door. Maybe somebody's going to greet the kids. Um, someone's the concierge and they could um, help people solve problems that they have. Um, someone's the reporter that they're going to be able to report on what's been learned or the recorder who writes it down. Um, or shares it out in some way. Uh, maybe it's sharing it out to some sort of um, parent communication. And then a PR director of how are we going to get this out um, about the things that our class is doing to the whole school. Uh, maybe you want to announce that to the whole school. Um, so kind of neat to think about that. And um, of course, uh, you might want to switch up jobs. Um, but also, um, this can be kind of like roles for life or jobs that they would have for life. I had a junior high class where we each had to um, apply for a different job within our classroom. Um, I was the police officer. And one day I was told to write myself a ticket for talking. <laughs> and I know none of you can imagine that, right? <laughs> but it is very memorable. And again, we all had a role or um, a responsibility for helping our class run smoothly. Um, and then just remember, students should always be talking more than the teacher. If you have class periods where the teacher's doing all the talking, we can imagine, um, you know, that um, situation like in Ferris Bueller, where, where the teacher's just talking at the students and they are all checked out. Um, the person who's doing the talking is doing the learning. So we have to make sure that we let com kids communicate and we don't just talk at them the whole time. Um, also increase student agency in learning. So more choice and voice to show what they know. So um, let kids choose, you know, maybe we're going to focus on a certain topic, but then give them a couple choices under that topic. Also, we want them um, you know, to hear that voice and to really find ways to show us what they know about something and not just um, tell us or turn in some little worksheet, right? How can they prove what they know? How can they apply that into a project or something visible in that way? And then also we want to provide opportunities for students to give feedback to us. So, hey, when we do this, I'm not very engaged because it's really boring. I think we could try something else. Um, or they might just tell us what they love about class and maybe we could see how we can do that more or in different contexts. So really let kids offer a little bit of feedback to us. And then we also have participation in the form of images. Um, so when we think about those DJs, like they said, um, you know, what images are they evoking you know, and accessing for their crowd, we can do that with students too. So we're going to create stunning graphics to advertise class content, um, make memorable posters, and turn important ideas into standout images. Our lives are full of images, right? We are on Instagram and Facebook and um, different parts of social media, um, looking at images all the time, we really remember what we see. And so when we create those graphics and, um, and those posters and things like that, that can help us show our learning um, and kids can get really excited about it. It might even um, help high school teachers catch the interest of some kids that might 
be potential um, learners in their class, right? Um, we also might use something like thinking maps or anchor charts to make learning visible and provide visual references. So I'm going to go ahead a couple slides here. Um, these would be some thinking maps. Um, basically, they're like a graphic organizer to help us organize those thoughts or maybe even details about things that we're reading. Um, and they just help us get it out of our heads, right, and write it down. So for a lot of kids, this is a great way to study um, for a test or something like that. But sometimes it's just important to write it down in this kind of way to just disseminate all that we're learning in a topic and just put it down on paper and graphically kind of um, organize our thoughts. So these are some um, ideas of those kinds of charts that we could draw. Uh, and there's a link there on this slide. So if you want more ideas from this source, um, you can go to that site. They have a lot of good ideas. Um, so yeah, so you might have this parts in whole. Um, when we break down a topic, we also might do a sequencing, maybe even for a book or a novel that they're reading. Um, when we're studying vocabulary, lots of times we do a bubble map where a, one word's in the middle and other um, words that describe it are on the outside. So we can really just draw out our thinking there. They talked about anchor charts too. These are some, um, some examples of some anchor charts that you can make. Um, basically, they're like um, a chart with necessary information for kids, right? Um, so you might want to sketch it out if you're going to make one of these with your students. Uh, you could use a pencil. You could um, reuse good parts um, again on another anchor chart. Um, you could reveal a little bit of the chart at a time, like if you're talking about text features with kids and you're going to focus on the table of contents one day, maybe that's the rest of it is kind of hidden in behind another piece of chart paper. Um, there's some other um, ideas over here, but basically you can let the kids come up with the parts of the anchor chart with you. So I used to make these during writing class, and um, sometimes they would be reading a whole bunch of books that are all um, written in a certain style. So maybe they were how-to books. And then we would come together to make an anchor chart that would focus on all of the things we noticed in uh, that authors do in a how-to book. Um, and so we kept that chart. Um, others might give directions on how to get something done, but they're kind of graphic and bold, right? You can hang them on your wall and kids can use them almost like a cheat sheet or like, um, you know, the essential information on a certain subject. So anchor charts can be a really good thing to do with your kids. I'm going to go back a couple slides here. And another idea here is to um, make time daily for visual literacy activities. Um, and one idea is the New York Times, what's going on in this picture? So you can just Google New York Times, what's going on in this picture, and it'll show up even on social media for you. And so I'm going to pop ahead again. This is one of those pictures. Uh, sometimes I think we get, um, so we're asked um, even in a different way, like write a caption for this picture. So what's going on here? So I kind of see that somebody was playing like giant Jenga there, it looks like to me. And the kid is dressed up uh, where it has face paints. It looks like a lion, but yet yeah, it's got some like islandy feel to the style of that. Um, and I'm wondering if he's keeping those blocks away, you know, anyway, you can come up with unique situations and have kids just look critically at some different pictures to try to tell what's going on and share those out. Some might be funny, some might be poignant, um, you know, just important to um, really look critically at all these pictures that are surrounding us. I think this is very engaging um, just because kids are on Instagram all the time with their pictures, right? Um, make it about, um, find a picture that has something to do with something that you're learning and say, we're going to do some more investigating like this too. So I think high school kids would really love something like this.
even junior high kids, elementary kids, everybody. And then even they say, you know, just for different images and the way we see things, um, might you change up uh, the lighting in your classroom every now and then. So we're used to having these overhead fluorescent lights on. They can honestly be pretty distracting for some of our students, including our ADHD students. Um, and sometimes it's nice to have those floor lamps around the room, or maybe even you're going to dim one set of lights. And, uh, you know, it's like some quiet work time, maybe for a little bit or a group time and they're, they're interacting with each other and you're going to just dim those lights to show, hey, we're switching our activity. Um, and this is going to be kind of a low key thing and we're going to have a softer light. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, friends. Sorry. Okay, we'll go back through. All right, and now um, we are going to connect with our students. And I think we've said this over and over in para training, right? Uh, it's all about those relationships and connecting with our students. Um, there's a famous quote that where there is no significant relationship, there is no significant learning. Uh, so we have to connect with our kids. I think if we think back to our favorite teachers or our teachers that we learn the most from, it's those ones that really connected with us and that we could tell cared about us. So we have to show that to our kids too. So how can we connect with them? How can we keep them engaged with us then? Um, well, one thing is every day, talk to your kids about things that aren't involved with school. Maybe it's an activity that they're in. Maybe it's just their life. Maybe you know that they're going through a hard time and you're just gonna go check in with them and see how they're doing. Um, ask them how that dance recital was or that baseball game was and just um, let them know that you care about them as a person too. Uh, and then you could have class meetings too. So, um, you know, depending on your level, elementary, this is easier because you have the same kids first thing in the morning every day or all day long, maybe. Um, for older kids, maybe they have a homeroom time that you can have some kind of class meeting and some sort of topic to discuss as a whole. Um, for me, class meetings would oftentimes be a time where I would bring up um, a concern I was having for the kids or maybe a problem we were having in our classroom. And I let them help me solve that problem and make a commitment into what their behavior would be in the future. So we might end the class um, meeting by saying, you know, one thing I will do in the future is, and then we always ended the class meeting with um, a, a compliment to the person sitting on their right. Um, and then that person had to say, thank you and give eye contact. And the other person said, you're welcome. So we were practicing some great social skills there. Um, I think that is one of the biggest team builders I've ever done in my classroom. I saw the comments to, to the kids go from being very superficial, like you're a good friend at the beginning of the year to very specific, like you've been trying so hard to pass your 12s in multiplication. You did that the other day and I'm so proud of you for it. Um, and that just really bonded my class. And I, I love those moments of hearing them. Uh, also be intentional about positive interactions, um, the gestures and the words um, through the greeting and the feedback that we give kids. Um, just, we have to show them that positivity and that we're gonna be careful about the way we talk to them and give them dignity in those feet in that feedback and respect um but letting them know i'm proud of you i see you what you're doing is great um and then sometimes our feedback has to be a little bit more corrective and that's fine too but when they know that we care then it's easier to give that feedback so we really want to connect to kids and um, have them respect us and us respect them um and then just at the bottom smile more <laughs> Um, we get stressed out and bogged down and boy, the last few years in teaching have been absolute examples of, of that kind of stress, but we have to smile more. We have to be nicer. We have, you know, um, take time to do all those things for the kids. Remember, we might be the most positive people they meet all day long. Uh, so 
look for those um, times to really connect with kids and show them that we care. Engaging our students is not something that we can force. It is not about compliance. Instead, educators must create the conditions that invite students to throw more of themselves into their learning. And that is from the 2017-14 uh, uh, Michigan Teacher of the Year who um, supplied us with a lot of this information today. So thank you to him. Um, again, we can't make kids be involved, but we have to get creative. It's us honing our art of education to really get them involved in school. I wanna invite you all to my August training day. We don't have the date set quite yet. It will be very soon, um, but I hope you can join in for a great day in August. We always have a theme and this year is cooking up a great year and it will be your recipe for success. So. Check back at esu8.org um, or check your inbox because I'll be emailing out um, the um, details with that training. But we hope you can um, make it. Um, I just think one of the best parts is getting all of you wonderful Paris together so that you can really collaborate um, and talk and share ideas and share your own expertise from your your building. So you guys are so wonderful at your jobs and all of your students and teachers are so lucky to have you working with them. Okay, so again, thanks. Here's my email. If you have any questions, always shoot them to me or call the ESU. Um, I love hearing from Paris. And these are some of our resources from today. So, hey, thanks everybody. Um, have a great end of the year, take care of yourselves and try to um, relax and practice a little self care to make it through to the end. Um, I know you can do it. Thanks again. Bye bye.